Welcome to episode 2, Cheyenne Practice of Mythology and the Effects of Colonization. Following from our first episode, we will be discussing the immediate effects of European colonization on the practice to Cheyenne religious rituals and beliefs, looking first at the immediate legislation made. The Cheyenne tribe was originally composed of agricultural, static villages. With the introduction of horses from foreign settlers, the northern Cheyenne developed a nomadic lifestyle and subsequently adapted their clothing, housing and some aspects of their mythology with their increased connection to fellow plains tribes such as the Arafo and Sioux. While this introduction of horses, in addition to sporadic trading with French immigrants as early as 1680, was the Cheyenne's first connection with European settlers, their first extended and lasting contact was in 1825, with the creation of the first Friendship Treaty, as signed by Cheyenne leaders and the American, General Henry Atkinson of Missouri, accompanied by 476 military men. Unregulated contact escalated to violence after the American Civil War, which ended on April 9, 1865. After this, more European-American settlers expanded into the West, until the violence reached a pitch which inspired many peace treaties which were subsequently broken. Following this, the Cheyenne, in addition to many other Native American groups, were engaged in a series of wars and battles which depleted their land and resources. The background for the first lasting European dictation over Cheyenne religious practices occurs in this scene. Populations ravaged by savage and dishonourable war, rife illness contracted from the immigrants, Bands pushed into reservations where their land was restricted. The government set out to fund culling of bison, the nutrition of the Plains tribes and nations, and thus cornered many Native Americans into relying on government-distributed rations as their only food source. Eventually, the increased contact between Native Americans and European Americans developed a form of media propaganda against Native Americans, including Cheyenne tribes and bands. This was added to with our first source, a letter from Henry Mortella. He was the 15th United States Secretary of the Interior, in office from April 18, 1882 to March 3, 1885. Included in the link is a photograph, titled Figure 1, A primary source scan of a photographic print of Henry Mortella, taken in 1902, which is now housed in the Library of Congress. Imagine you were to meet Henry Mortella as this photograph was taken. Before you, it's a 72-year-old man in a three-piece suit. His stately beard and well-fitted suit look powerful and dignified, and his bow tie, fashionable, formal and expensive evening wear in the early 1900s, shows taste and sophistication as seen by his peers in the Senate. A man who can afford an expensive suit, a photograph commission, and a bow tie. Teller is shown as wealthy and powerful. Combined with his political position as senator, he would have been a respected, privileged, and wealthy member of society. This is a primary source, and while there is no proof included for the fashion of the times and other such assumptions, all are supported with other photographs and documents from the time period, which lend background information to the photograph itself which shows basic details like race, which would have greatly influenced Teller's stature in the prevalent society of the time. This powerful and respected man wrote a letter to the Bureau of Indian Affairs requesting a ban on the Sundance, a Native American ritual described in episode 1, from Washington on December 2nd, 1882. It reads as follows. I to call your attention to what I regard as a great hindrance to the civilization of the Indians, viz. the continuance of the old heathenish dances, such as the sun dance, scalp dance, etc. Active measures should be taken to discourage all feasts and dances of the character I have mentioned. This letter is shown in the attached link as a secondary source, figure 2. The author, Robert N. Clinton, Professor of Law, explains on a website that he accessed this letter originally through the US government, but having found no copy online, decided to transcribe it into a PDF. Although a secondary source by an unknown and therefore unreliable source, the information has been distributed to many articles, and while not mainstream, as a direct quotation of a US government legislation, 
it would definitely be in the interest and capability of the party to remove the source if it were incorrect. This means that, as the article was published February 24, 2008, this article can be assumed to be accurate after having been publicly available for nine years. written by Henry Morteller on its own would have been incapable of any serious change to Cheyenne rituals and practices on its own, other than perpetuating European-American racism towards Native Americans. However, this letter was replied to five months later by the Bureau of Indian Affairs to which it was addressed. This was written by the Honourable Hiram Price, appointed Chief Clerk of the Bureau of Indian Affairs in 1881, and later that year, was appointed Commissioner of Indian Affairs by the US President James A. Garfield, a position which Price served from 1881 to 1885. The attached photograph, listed as in the link as figure 3, was taken at some point between 1885 and 1865. If you were to meet Hiram Price, you would see another dignified man in a three-piece suit, brow furrowed in concentration and hair parted neatly to the side. His upturned, starched collar an upright posture on the backless chair, give a sense of elegance, good manner and breeding. His clean-shaven face, neat hair, cut to the fashionable length, and tailored suit give the impression of great wealth. This photograph, like the first, is a primary source scan of photographic negative on glass using a wet colliden process which was first invented in 1851, recently enough for it to be new and expensive. All of this information combines to give a man of expensive taste and education, respected by society and living as the powerful, institutionalised majority of his day. Although being a white, wealthy, male member of government doesn't make him an inherently bad person, it did give him a significant measure of privilege. He responded to Henry Mortella's letter of advice from Washington on the 30th of March, 1883, with the following legislation. The sun dance, the scalp dance, the war dance, and all other so-called feasts assimilating thereto shall be considered Indian offences, and any Indian found guilty of being a participant in any one or more of these offences shall, for the first offence committed, be punished by withholding from the person or persons so found guilty by the court his or their rations for a period not exceeding ten days, and if found guilty of any subsequent offence under this rule, shall be punished by withholding his or their rations for a period not less than fifteen days, nor more than thirty days, or by incarceration in the agency prison for a period not exceeding 30 days. This letter source was posted in PDF on the same website as the first letter of advice by Teller, and therefore holds the same trappings and limitations of the first, although it also has the vote of confidence of being publicly available nine years after publishing. suggesting the banning of the Cheyenne practice of traditional religious dances and rituals, and the ensuring legislation effectively created an environment of ethnocide for the Cheyenne. The federal legislation constricted Cheyenne to reservations, funded the depletion of bison, and essentially removed and destroyed the nomadic culture and, as a result, their religious practices. After this, the Cheyenne bat- became dependent on government rations for food, which were refused for a period of time if a person failed to comply with the laws which forbade their religious practices. This meant that unless the Cheyenne were willing to sacrifice their culture, heritage, and religious adherence, they were threatened with temporary starvation. This led to a significant decrease in practicing Cheyenne, while the US government attempted to assimilate them into the white society by erasing their culture. Although there were still rogue bands of practicing Cheyenne, and still, many still silently following the religion within the enforced reservations. A great many Cheyenne lost a significant connection to their culture and their history as a result. The federal prohibition of an entire religion, called the Code of Indian Offences, 
lasted from its drafting in 1983 until it was revised in 1933. This created a significant difference to the amount of Cheyenne who practiced their religion, and do so to this day. The overall effect of European colonization on the practice of Cheyenne rituals was one of suppression and enforced ignorance, but since then there have been many great steps towards the reconnection of people to their land, and the start of many attempts to reverse what damage was made.